thank you for inviting me to talk this evening about John, because he was such a good friend. I say, fished with him many times in the last sort of 20 years or so, and he's, he's really taught me everything I know about river fishing. There's nothing John couldn't do that went in river fishing. And uh, we had many good trips together, and every time he produced a book, he gave me a copy, and on the table over there, you'll see many, only a few of what John produced in the way of books. He, he was a quite a prolific writer, and although I say prolific writer, he, he didn't like a lot of the modern patterns that appeared in some of the magazines. He, he would never take a contract on to produce one a month. He, he would only write an article when he thought he had something to say, and that, that was his, the way he worked. And uh, the flies he produced, which I'll show you some tonight, they, they always had a reason. He never sort of sat down and thought, oh, if I put this bit of colour wool on and that colour wool on, we'll catch a fish on it. It had to be a question he'd been set by the fish and he was looking for an answer. And um, many of his flies, I, I've got a, a few there to tie tonight, and uh, they all come, in fact, you will find them all in his book, um, John Goddard's Fly Patterns, because the book that's over there now, um, Many few years ago, we produced a limited edition, I think it was 50 or 55 copies, that all had a set of the flies with them. And uh, that, that, they were all sold before they were even published. And that's how popular John was. And I, I, think, um, I think between us, we tied about a couple of thousand flies to go with the books. And, and there's been one or two produced since. But uh, no, John was well known all over the world. There wasn't anywhere in the world that John wasn't known, I don't think, as a fisherman. You mentioned something and he knew it, you know, and the people that he knew was nobody's business, you know, and sometimes we'd get down to the fishery and he said, oh, today so-and-so's coming, John. So I was lucky, fortunate that through John, I also met many great fishermen, you know, and we had some good times down there. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to put together a few of his, some, some of the, the one or two of the patterns I've got there are probably dating back to the 60s, but they're still as good today as they ever were. And this was, this is what, uh, and there was one or two in the new patterns um, that would see, hardly ever seem to be off John's line these days. He was a very practical fisherman. I mean, we used, I used to call for him and his rod was already split in half, but folded in an aluminium tube and we had to put it in the back of the car and even the fly was already on there before we'd left home, you know. <laughs> he was that practical. And <laughs> Although we did get to the fishery once and two inches at the top of his rod was in the back of my car. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, John, I think I've lost a tipper. <laughs> and the, but the next week, he'd, he'd sellotape the top eye back onto it. And so that was the practical way he was. He wasn't a, a man to sort of in his latter years when I knew him, he wasn't a man to spend a fortune on his fishing. What he did, he was a practical man and he knew his fishing. And that was the way he was. Because sometimes, I mean, we'd have lunch together at the hut and then he, he said, well, you go off downstream, John. And I'd go off and when I look back, he still hadn't moved many yards. He, he, he only needed a few yards of river to catch a fish from. And I think if you look on the website, even uh, there's a little piece on there about him I did. And, once we were sitting at the hut and a rise started in front, we see these brownies start to appear, you know. And he said, well, before you finish, when you finish your sandwiches, John, just try. And I tried, I couldn't put a few small things. And I went down the river, came back in about an hour, hour and a half later, and he'd had six, six out of the seven fish without getting out of his chair. <laughs> and, and we had what we called the, the settee club, the, the lounge seat club down there. You had to be able to catch one sitting at the hut, you know, in your chair. <laughs> but I never got in the club. But I think Peter Lapsley did. But, but no, that was the way John was. He, he could sit there and he was so patient. And, and if, if you watched him, you could watch him for a long time down the river. And the only thing that moved on him was his arm to cast. He'd stand there and stand there, and he barely moved his head or his legs or anything. All he moved was the, the casting arm. And sometimes, I mean, he was dedicated to grayling in, in the latter years. I mean, he would, when we were nymph fishing for grayling, if he saw a trout, he would pull it out of the way quick before the trout had a job to get at it. And he, if he saw a big grayling, he, he, anything over two pound he liked to, to fish for, and he, 50, 60 times, at least he'd send his nymph past some of them. 
but 99% of the time he'd eventually get it, you know. So, anyway, that, that's, a, that's the sort of man John was. He was a nice chap. To some people, he was difficult to get to know, but once you got to know him, he was a good chap, yeah. He was, a, he was very... I think in some ways he was a bit reserved, but although he sort of, some people thought he was a bit abrupt, some, he was a bit sort of reserved when he was in sort of company he didn't really know, and so that, that, that was where.